Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, Richard Kidd. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary to the Army for Strategic Integration. I'd like to welcome you here to this presentation on uh, Army installations of the future. You know, if you've been listening to the Chief the last few days, he's been very clear on two things. The Army fights wars, and the Army prepares to fight wars, okay? And we prepare on our installations. That's where we build readiness, and it is increasingly where we fight from. Our installations are our initial deployment platforms. We maneuver from our installations in multiple domains directly into combat as part of multi-domain operations. As we do this, there's a growing recognition included in the National Defense Strategy that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. And our installations are part of the fight and under threat. Cue video. Installations are the initial maneuver platform of the Army. From outposts to forts to current day installations, the home base of the Army has evolved over time and must continue to evolve in advance of an enemy who will leverage current and future means of attacks to hinder Army missions. Technology creates opportunities for the Army, but also opens up a new realm of vulnerabilities that must be guarded against. Installations are where soldiers live, raise families, train, generate combat power, and conduct warfighting missions. They are part of the modern battle space and thus are subject to attack by an enemy that will leverage conventional, unconventional, or new technology to its advantage. Emerging threats have changed the Army's operational environment. In response, the battle space has expanded. We need to reconsider how we view Army installations. They are part of the strategic support area that stretches from the homeland to initial point of entry. All right, if that video was gonna continue, I'll talk you through a few of the vignettes it was gonna show, all right? See how I can act on my feet. The, the video was gonna show our installations under attack in cyberspace and in information warfare space. It's gonna show the adversary monitoring the social media networks, not only of our soldiers, but of their families, and manipulating those networks to create friction in the mobilization and deployment actions. The video would show our key infrastructure, our cyber, our energy and water under attack in cyberspace. And the video would have shown unique, unconventional warfare direct attacks against our installations. So think of drones, smart drones, trained with artificial intelligence that can, can target helicopters, or communications networks on our installations, again, to present them from performing their warfighting function. We're gonna, if you wanna see the video, and it's a good video, we've got it downstairs at uh, area 1725, 1725, come on down there, and we will show you this video and two other great videos to put you in the frame of the fact that our installations are now part of the fight they're under threat and they're engaged every day. And the Army staff is dealing with this challenge and no one on the Army staff is dealing with it uh, more on a daily basis than Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham. I've had the pleasure of knowing General Bingham since uh, she was a, a, a Brigadier General. I hope I was nice to her back then. We still get along pretty well. But uh, she leads the, the Army staff's installation management efforts and uh, is a great asset for the installation community and our team, ma'am. Thank you, Richard. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's great to see everyone, and thank you all so much for spending a few moments with us this morning. We're absolutely excited to be here, and I think excitement is in the air. So who had the opportunity to start out day one with us and hear the Secretary of the Army's remarks? Who was here for that? Great. I would say excitement is in the air. Uh, all week, the Secretary of the Army has been talking about a renaissance. And so renaissance is a, a word that we are now taking upon and using that ourselves because for sure installations are a big part of that renaissance in that we too are changing the way that we are doing business and the way that we are posturing for the future. So as we kicked off the FY, we greatly appreciate the bill that was signed and the uh, budget that has been allocated to us. We want to say thank you to our congressional members for that, and we are hopeful as good stewards of government resourcing that that will become the new norm as it relates to on-time budgets. 
uh, for sure any and all things that we do are directly uh, related and tied to soldier readiness, which equates to family readiness. Uh, I have the good fortune as the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management to oversee all things that are related to our portfolio consisting of infrastructure, environment, energy, soldier and family programs for all of our installations worldwide to the tune of about 156 Army installations across the globe, $17 billion. And so over the past few years, we've made great strides to improve things for our soldiers and our families where they live. That is a big area of uh, focus for us right now uh, in that our housing areas, our barracks, we've made tremendous strides in that and certainly that's been a great uh, focus for us. Additionally, we are on a trajectory to improve our facility sustainment uh, percentage. Right now we're tracking at about 82 percent of our facility sustainment model. Over time that will see itself to 90 percent in the year 2024. That's an absolute good thing. It's a great trajectory because with that increased funding stream, we will be able to continually improve our facilities and to begin to slow and arrest the degradation that we've seen over time. So all of that bodes only goodness for us and it is a key focus area for myself and our secretary, Mr. Jordan Gillis. On the reform front, we are continually assessing all of our programs and our services, our activities that we are providing for our soldiers, making sure that every dollar is spent on those activities and programs that are directly tied to soldier readiness, soldier lethality, and all of that, of course, is encompassing our family readiness. We want to use all of our precious resources to make sure they are going to all those systems and programs most needed. So the video, you saw parts of it. Uh, we just, uh, I'll tell you, the operating environment has changed, as Richard so aptly pointed out. We see ourselves evolving as a result of those threats that are out there uh, and actually increasing day by day. So that is forcing us to think differently about the way that we are programming and planning for our installations of the future. So put it another way, our installations are no longer safe havens. They're currently uh, constantly under attack and particularly when you think about the element of cyber. So we have to plan for that and safeguard against it. So given that uh, to main our Army, maintain our Army's competitive advantage, uh, we want to continually embrace those changes that enhance our ability to train, to protect, and to project the force across the land. So as we think about installations of the future, we know that we must leverage technology because that's what's going to take us into that futuristic state so that we can continue to provide the world-class training facilities. We can provide the world-class maintenance facilities, organic industrial base, mobilization and power projection platforms. All of that is important to the way our Army trains, as Richard said, and prepares for war. We want to leverage artificial intelligence, big data analytics, smart cities, uh, technology, autonomous vehicles and other innovations. So when I was a garrison commander, I had so many folks that would say, hey, then Colonel Bingham, I would love, we would love to have a bus route on, at the time, Fort Lee. And if you think about, and fast forward, that was 13 years ago, if you think about the use of autonomous vehicles and being able to pull up to a bus stop that is programmed to take you anywhere across an installation. It's safe, you won't have to worry about it, you won't have to worry about paying for it per se, and being able to get to your next point of desti destination. That technology we already know exists, and so we want to leverage that technology on our smart cities or inside of our futuristic uh, installations. So what exactly would an installation of the future look like? So I say, don't ask me because I'm year group 81, old person. Let's ask the folks who will be most closely aligned to using our installations of the future, and that would be our millennials and our post-millennials. So we partnered with TRADOC, uh, Commander 
had the opportunity to visit all of the centers of excellence across TRADOC and actually talk to uh, young millennials, uh, some of their spouses talked to us, uh, young people who said, here's what we think that we would want in our installations of the future. So we taped several of those vignettes and now I'd like to play those back to you or for you so that you can hear what the millennials have to say about installations of the future. We'll roll the uh, vignettes and hopefully these work. Hi, I'm an Army civilian as well as an Army spouse. And on installations in the future, I would like to see us use hologram technology or FaceTime technology to be able to service our service members and our uh, family members more efficiently. I should be able to just, at a click of a mouse, come into the room upon request and teach an Army family team building class or give a brief to a room of soldiers who need it immediately. Equivalent thereof of Amazon Fresh Marketplaces that are automated uh, grocery or deli checkout systems where soldiers uh, could go into the marketplace and purchase foods without even uh, having to stop at the counter. They ultimately could select their choices of food and drink and walk past the cash register that's already automated. I'm an Army spouse and on the installations of the future I would like to see the usage of drones like dropping off my prescriptions or even my groceries. Future Army installations is saving money with energy costs via all our smart systems that we have now. So uh, everything from lighting and AC and heat control to security systems can now all be controlled by one panel uh, via Wi-Fi and that's what you see in smart homes today. It saves energy because the system can monitor itself what did you think? How about that virtual checkout? Wouldn't that be cool? I really like that. You heard them talk about the use of holograms and drones. Can we get there? Who says yes? All right, roll tide. Uh, so I knew I would get something out of that. Uh, so we want to continue to prioritize our uh, senior leader priorities, which of course are readiness, uh, modernization and reform with an ever mindset of taking care of our soldiers, our civilians and families around the globe as we continue to train, to mobilize and to deploy our forces anywhere around the world. I think when we talk about our installations of the future, one of the things that really strikes me as an initiative that we've started so many years ago and it's simply partnerships. Uh, we are doing so many, many things with corporate America, with our academia partners and leaders outside of our gates, so much so that over the last, I'd say, five years, we've been able to save about $38 million in those partnerships. So at every opportunity, we want to continue with those partnerships, even when we think about installations of the future, because I believe that will continue to drive us to efficiencies that uh, we want to see ourselves. And I would often find myself saying as a garrison commander or a senior commander uh, a couple times these words, there's absolutely nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnerships of all of those entities outside our gates. That's all of you sitting here as our industry partners, our academia partners, and our local state, federal, uh, corporate partners and community leaders out there. And I think that will continue yet into the future. One thing is for sure though, the men and women who serve our military, the soldiers who are on point every day for this nation in places all around the globe, I don't think they will ever be replaced by any type of a robot or anything like that. We will enhance their capability on the war, field, uh, war grounds wherever they may be deployed, but uh, we believe that we've got the greatest fighting force on the planet. And with that, it's my privilege to conclude my remarks and introduce you now to the Assistant Secretary for Installations, Energy and Environment, Mr. Jordan Gillis. Jordan. Is this on? Oh, oh, yeah, it is. Well, uh, well thanks. This is a very pleasant surprise. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to, to address you this morning. Uh, good morning. It's been a great couple days. I think you, like me, have, have had a chance to hear from a lot of Army senior leaders. So my guidance is, if anything I says contradicts what they've said, go with what they've said, and then circle back with me later. So what I'd uh, 
What I'd like to share with you is a little bit about how we're changing the way we're thinking about installations. And uh, this includes a video, which is your reward for suffering through listening to me talk. So I'll, I'll try to hurry and get there quickly. But to give a context, Army has about 156 installations, over 2,000 guard and reserve centers. And this enterprise encompasses about 13 and a half million acres. That's about the size of New Jersey and Maryland if you squished them together. Now, I don't know why you'd want to squish New Jersey and Maryland together, and I don't know what you'd wind up with. Maybe lackadaisical drivers that's, that have an aggressive streak. I, I don't know. Is anybody here from Maryland or New Jersey? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, well, so back, back to what I really wanted to talk about. What we want to do is take a critical look at our installations and understand the gap between where we are today where we want to be in the future, and then figure out what strategies and initiatives we need to close that gap. The, uh, the Army vision states, and, I, and I'm quoting now, the Army of 2028 will be ready to deploy, fight, and win decisively against any adversary, anytime, anywhere, in a joint multi-domain, high-intensity conflict, while simultaneously deterring others and maintaining its ability to conduct irregular warfare. The Army will do this through the employment of modern manned and unmanned ground combat vehicles, aircraft sustainment systems and weapons, coupled with robust combined, combined arms formations and tactics based on modern warfighting doctrine and centered on exceptional leaders and soldiers of unmatched lethality. <laughs> so one thing that that vision has that is an unstated foundational component is that Army installations are the platform to make all that happen. And like you heard from Richard, multi-domain battle concept uh, has installations as part of the battle space. And the national defense strategy states that the homeland is, is no longer a sanctuary. So it's really technology that has caused us to change our way of thinking about installations. But it's also technology that gives us a lot of opportunities and, and gives us potential uh, for a different way that we use them and I will show you a video that will demonstrate a little bit about what we're thinking. So roll the video. Technology is driving tremendous change throughout Department of Defense installations and cities worldwide. Future capabilities that optimize combinations of artificial intelligence, sensors, and deep analytics will give Army Garrison commanders new tools to detect, consider, and react to conditions almost instantaneously. Let's jump ahead to the year 2040 and imagine a morning in the life of an Army Garrison commander. Sari, how is our day looking? Weather is clear and 70 degrees. No CCIR to report. All services operational. ThreatCon is at Bravo. Two new Alaracs have arrived and no reported blotters. Sari, what's my schedule look like? You have an 0800 threat brief with DPTMS, an 0900 budget discussion on obligation variants with your resource manager, a 1000 walkthrough with a new obstacle course, and a 1200 working lunch with your deputy. Good. We are expecting three dignitaries on post today. Great, alert me when the dignitaries pass through security. Yes, Colonel. In regards to lunch, would you prefer the garden salad or the steamed vegetables? I would prefer a cheeseburger and fries. Reminder, you have a formal dinner at the governor's mansion this evening. Your biometrics reader and daily caloric expenditure predictor is indicating you will want to consider the salad in anticipation of that dinner. Fine, Sari, salad it is. Good morning, Captain. Do you have anything to report? Good morning, Colonel. Alpha Unit was scheduled to train on Range 2 Whiskey today. We rescheduled them to Range 4 Yankee due to risk of grass fires with dry conditions and high winds. Sari, what action have you taken? I have already notified the Brigade and Battalion Commanders, the Sergeant's Major, and each of the Company Commanders and First Sergeants. Sari, how are we doing on energy usage? All acceptable, Colonel. Barracks energy is starting to creep up, and I've already recalibrated controls to adjust energy usage during the duty day when the troops are in training. Due to the extreme heat, 
we are anticipating a higher than average cooling load. Sari, alter thermostat setbacks for unoccupied buildings based on field training and adjust temps when troops return. Yes, Captain. What's our current energy usage considering expected temperature? We have been generating an excess of loads for the past three days. Batteries are full. We can use this surplus to cover anticipated peak loads and avoid extra demand charges. Excellent. Ma'am, I'm detecting a spike in the Cyber Command Center. Checking now. Anything to be concerned about? Negative. Not according to the cyber analytics. It appears to be a relatively low-level denial-of-service attack coming out of Central Asia, keeping the servers busy. External sensors across our regional network are not detecting any unusual activity. Ma'am, you have an incoming call from the senior commander's office. Connect to Sari. Good morning, General Rodriguez. Good morning, Shelley. Since the chief of staff is visiting next week, I'd like to do a virtual dry run later today. Can we make that happen? Yes, sir, General. I will see you at your office later today. Sari, I need you to modify my schedule. I've already notified your director of operations and HR. Holograms are queued up for your joint review and discussion with them in 23 minutes. Your remaining schedule is being adjusted now for the senior commander's dry run. Excellent. Colonel, you have an incoming call from your director of public works. Okay, Sari, connect us. Good morning. I wanted to give you a good news item. Great, Bob. What is it? Well, ma'am, Sari discovered a low flow in an HVAC unit, indicating a fault with a one-way check valve. A maintenance bot isolated the fault, printed a replacement part, and droned it out to the building, where it linked up with a mechanic who installed it with no downtime. So what did that save us, Sari? Identifying the failure before it happened saved the loss of a $102,362.23 piece of equipment and up to two weeks downtime. Great news, Bob. Talk to you later. Okay, Captain, let's make sure we're prepped for the Chief's visit. Hope those holograms are ready to roll. Roger that, ma'am. So, uh, so I'll, I'll share a couple of observations of my own and, and what we've heard from others about this video. So I'll get, I'll get the easy ones out of the way. Uh, so pardon the calorie shaming, and uh, please excuse the uniforms and hairstyles, and then, then we can talk about what was really in there. So a couple of things. The garrison commander of, of 2040, that sounds like a long way off, but whoever that is is, is likely either a cadet right now or, uh, or a cadet in the very near future. So class of 2020 to class of 2024, uh, that's, that's how close this future is to us. So a couple of the things that, that we've heard is like uh, a garrison commander would never get that involved with real-time energy monitoring, or you know, a garrison commander uh, wouldn't be into, into those kind of details on a day-to-day -day basis. F fine, valid assumption. But a lot of the things that we're not hearing, I think, are, are almost more informative. So nobody is saying that that technology is not possible or that these kind of applications are outside of our grasp. So really, I, I think that's indicative of the fact that, that folks now are, can almost take for granted the role that technology plays in our lives and the way that technology enables our day-to-day -day activities and business decisions. So I think that's very telling, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. The other thing that is obviously missing from the video is that uh, there's not an entire branch gathering the data that, that went into this. There, there was not a uh, room full of technicians analyzing the data. There's not a formal staffing process complete with a Form 5 that gets brought to the garrison commander to make these decisions. Um, and there's not a large staff implementing the decisions or, or taking action after the decisions have been made. We're doing all that today, and it costs time, and it costs money, and it costs resources. But in this scenario, you see that all those activities were completed in seconds. They were enabled by technology, and the commander was informed. What we need is help to make this a reality. So you'll hear in conversations with the installation community that we don't have adequate resources to maintain the installations and the facilities that we have today. And the resourcing shortfall has become a familiar conversation, and it's a very important one, but we don't want that to crowd out the conversation about our future state 
in our future technology. We don't want the resource challenges of today to overshadow the light of the possible in the future. So instead, we need to, to have a different discussion, and that is how can we use technology to support readiness, modernize installations, and reduce costs? We need to figure out how to strategically implement technology to increase lethality and security while reducing the demand for resources. So there's no denying the world is on the cusp of technology applications that will fundamentally change our lives, the way we do business, the way we work. Industry is taking note and is investing. Universities are exploring. Cities are investing and implementing smart city technology. And I'll tell you that by our unique nature and our missions, the Army is perfectly suited to leverage these same technologies and these same innovations. Um, our installations are the perfect ecosystems to adapt technology and to set the standards across the board. To do this, we're looking to digitize the installations in their entirety. Everything from stuff you saw in the video, like facility operations, uh, building occupancy experiences, advanced safety, frictionless security, um, community experiences, that's all within our grasp. So imagine a soldier and their family moving from community where to another community where they're, they're already recognized, they are already uh, registered and engaged, ready to work on the first day. All their settings carry over from one place to another, minimizes stress, reduces downtime. Kids are already registered in school, engaged in their familiar extracurricular activities. Spouses are already employed. I could talk future state stuff all day, um, but what I, I really wanted to share with you is that to understand where industry can really help, and to help us create the business cases that will allow us to get the dollars to invest in these things, we are going to hold an industry day early next year. And, and I'm not going to tell you just to check Fed, Fed Biz Ops uh, to, to look for the announcement. I will tell you to stay engaged with the installations of the future team. Who knows who they are? Please raise your hands. Mr. Kidd, Jason, who else? Yep, folks in the back. Ms. Holst, right, lots of folks. And if you can't track them down after this, because they make a quick getaway when I'm done, you can find them at uh, 1100 hours, that's 11 a.m., at uh, booth 1725, exhibit hall B, downstairs. And, uh, and they're ready to talk to help understand how industry can engage with us and uh, share the details as we know them so far uh, about the industry day that we have planned. So more to follow on that. Uh, encourage you to get with those folks. I'm also going to be here to answer questions. And uh, I will turn it back over to Mr. Kidd to help facilitate that. General Bingham and I will both be here. Thanks in advance. Look forward to working with you. Thanks, thanks sir. Thanks, ma'am. Appreciate that. So. I've watched that video, I don't know, 10 times, and every time I watch it, I see something new. I encourage you to go back, and there's lots of little things in there, like when her car drove in the gate, it went through the frictionless entry, and there were these little squares on the, in the roadway. That was checking the axle weight, the electromagnetic spectrum, and other things on the vehicle. So there's a lot in that, vi in that video to take a look at, besides the really cool uniforms, which we're going to ship to Army Futures Command right behind us. So I'm gonna, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please identify yourself, who you work for, what your question is. Try not to defend your PhD dissertation and, uh, direct, and ask who you want to answer the question, all right? First questions. Jeff Proch, why don't you ask a question? Well, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Kidd. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to know, what do you see the futures of energy savings performance contracts uh, for the Army and the DOD team. Mr. Geller? We got, we got lots of friends in the audience. Uh, well, so I, I think the Army's made uh, great use of ESPCs over the last, uh, well, they predate me, uh, so over the last 10 years at least. And, you know, I think that alternative finance mechanisms like ESPCs are going to be essential for us to bring installations into the future. Um, 
not only so that we can make the dollars available for the kind of invest future focused investments that we need, uh, but also so that we can be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars that we have today. And so ESPCs help us garner savings um, that, that show that we, we take our stewardship seriously. So I'm, I'm a big believer in, in ESPCs. Okay. Any more questions? I, I know about half of you. So you better hope someone asks a question because I'm just gonna, gonna come out there with the microphone and put you on the spot. So anything over here? All right. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Uh, and you are from? Uh, Dennis Ginley from Drone Shield. Uh, just, just top three priorities for the near term that kind of help bridge from today to, to getting to where the futures are. Uh, top three. I, I got this top three technology. I'm not sure that we have uh, worked our way through the um, priorities for technology. I think there's utility in all of what uh, we spoke to earlier, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, big data analytics. There is a use for all of those today. And so the video really did a great job, I think, of capturing some of the utility in all of those. And so what we want to do, and Jordan mentioned uh, with the part, the uh, industry day next year, uh, we are looking at uh, finding out kind of what industry is doing and seeing uh, from that scope, being able to look at how we might prioritize that in a pilot to, to, in a futuristic time period. It's a great question. Yeah, so at the industry day, we've identified a number of potential use cases. Uh, we've actually uh, got another chart, and if you talk to members of our team, we can talk through some of the sort of near-term use cases. We've got about a dozen or so, a little more than a dozen, of potential use cases for pilot projects that we're going to try to see where industry is. We actually track your technology and your competitors' technologies. It's of great interest to us, because in you saw sort of the command center philosophy for the garrison commander in there, and she could have easily had a counter drone system on her installation, but there's some legal issues as well as what we can do and where we can use that, and we're, we're wrestling with those right now. All right, any more questions? Tim Hill. Uh, General Bingham, uh, Mr. Gillis, thank you for uh, putting this forum on. Uh, just wanted to know what you see right now uh, are the, the, the greatest gaps and trying to get from where you are today to what you're trying to focus towards? I'll, well, I'll start, I'll start with one. We can pass it around. Uh, I, you know, all of this is great, and it's attainable. I guess there, there are two big hurdles in my mind. One is the, uh, the underlying infrastructure that needs to be in place. So a lot, of these, a lot of these technologies require something like a 5G or, I don't know, maybe by then it's a 6G backbone uh, that will enable them. And, and you know, besides the investment, that comes with security concerns and, and cyber vulnerabilities that we need to address. So that, that's, that's one hurdle. And, uh, and then, frankly, the other is funding. So you know, you, you've heard it from all the senior leaders uh, thanking Congress uh, for a very generous budget. Uh, you know, it was passed on time, uh, which was great for the Army. But we can't count on that in the future. And as we uh, have constrained funding, obviously the Army needs to allocate dollars to war fighting and lethality. Um, and, and we need to be able to be sure that, that dollars are available for things like uh, future investment. So I guess two things is the uh, enabling technology or the enabling backbone and the, and the cyber things that come with that and then the funding that uh, sort of underpins everything. And if I could uh, comment on Jordan's uh, comment about resourcing and the funding. Uh, I kind of look at it from a standpoint of the opportunity to partner with you all. So if you are looking at uh, emerging technology or innovations that you are doing, one way that we might get after a win-win situation might be that you use us, the Army installation, as your test bed for some innovative idea that you have going that it becomes kind of a win-win for both parties. And that's not something that we've done a lot of. I, I like to say we can think out of the box and, and, look, and kind of think our way through that. But if there's some innovative uh, uh, technique or initiative that you are developing within your own corporations where you might have the goodness of testing it on a military installation, we can work our way through that. I think that would be a great win-win. 
other questions. All right, any more questions? Ray. Well, see, I've got everybody's first names. <laughs> Ray Tractor, uh, Sandy Labs. Love the movie. Uh, can I expect a sequel on multi-domain battle space and, and the commander under threat? You know, Ray, if we did a sequel, we'd probably have to contract Sandia National Labs to run a d digital twin, and we could model it as we went. How would that sound? Yeah. No, look, we're on a, we're on a process of exploration. All right, we want to learn, as, as General Bingham said, and Mr. Gillis, we want to learn from industry, and we're going to continue to explore the future. And as we learn and think about that, yeah, we'll produce some more videos. All right, any more questions? I'm James Morningstar of the Center of Strategic Leadership. How do you see the installations playing a role in the domains of space and cyber and et cetera in the future? That's a great question. Jordan. <laughs> uh, I was just trying to retrieve the mic. I wasn't trying to say that I had the answer to that because uh, I don't. But uh, so I will purposely not answer your space question just because I don't know. But this, the cyber one and, and, and I and I haven't given it much thought, so I'll defer to, to Mr. Kidd or General Bingham. Um, but, but for the, the cyber piece, they are already basically our maneuver space uh, in that domain. So we fight the cyber fight, we, we counter the cyber fight from our installations. Um, and, and we are busy investing and, and trying to understand exactly what we need to do to in, provide all the enabling technologies and all the enabling infrastructure from an installation standpoint that then the cyber warriors uh, need to conduct their mission. So, you know, like, like, like we said for many of the other technologies, installations are the place um, where, where everything begins um, for the Army warfight and, and cyber is no exception. And if we look at the facilities uh, related control systems, that's an area within the cyber domain that we concern ourselves with. Our facilities are becoming more and more complex. And so that is an area that we are heavily uh, engaging in to make sure that we protect ourselves from cyber threats as it relates to those facility related control systems. Uh, it's a, a key area across the Department of Defense right now, and certainly we are doing our part to learn from not only what the service, the other services are engaging upon, but to le share those lessons learned across the Department of Defense so that uh, we are better uh, informed going forward. It's a great question, though. Thank you. So this effort is part of a broader Army effort to understand the future. So uh, yesterday's lunch, uh, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army mentioned the work with TRADOC G2 about understanding the future operating environment. We're part of that, and we uh, participate in what's called the Mad Scientist uh, activity with Georgia Tech, Florida State, other academic institutions. We look to our, our academic colleagues to help inform this effort. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to go to the Mad Science website, log in, take a look at all the presentations and the work that was done. I have time for one more question. Stephen Williams, Acquisition Experts. Thank you for the presentation and the vision for the future. One of the things that we're dealing with or see today is a bunch of joint bases. How are your efforts coordinated with the other services, particularly on a joint base? I think that's a great question. Uh, service. Uh, certainly as a, a service, uh, the Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, the good news is that all the way down from our service secretary through our chiefs of staff of all the services uh, have a great relationship in that we share lessons learned. And uh, I see that as no different across our Army installations. We will continue to share the lessons learned uh, that we are, are gaining momentum of. Right here in front of me is the Deputy Commanding General of uh, Installation Management Command, whose headquarters is at Joint Base San Antonio. And so it really is a co collaborative uh, arrangement uh, where we communicate, coordinate, and collaborate with each other to make uh, improvements to the Joint Base. So uh, we will take this momentum where we might be an Army insta entity talking across the Army installations. We're going to take the goodness of what we learn and apply that going forward, even across, I'm sure, the joint basis. So it's a great question. Thank you. I'll just add a little bit. Well, first of all, this is an Army forum, so 
I question the appropriateness of your question. No, no, I'm teasing. Uh, so all the services, to some extent, are looking at, at this. Uh, the Marines have installation next. Is that their, is that their initiative? Um, and, and so we, we cross talk pretty frequently and, and, and pretty often. Like General Bingham said, sharing lessons learned, leading practices, good ideas. Uh, but from a true joint base standpoint, if it is an Army-led joint base and, and we select that to pilot one of the technologies that, that we choose to pilot, no problem with that being a joint base. Uh, likewise, if there's an Air Force-led joint base where there's uh, Army interests and they are looking to, to uh, pilot a different technology, we would be all in support of that. Uh, especially given the, the fact that it could harvest lessons learned uh, that we can then uh, apply across the force. So I guess you know, the short answer is there's lots of crosstalk between the services, joint bases or joint bases, but uh, that they're by no means off limits uh, to, to pilot and, and learn from. Okay, 1725 Hall B. That is not when the vendors bring out the beers for happy hour. That is the booth that you go to at 1,100 hours to learn more about installations of the future. Sir, ma'am, I'd like to thank you for your time. The team back here, great work. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a great day.